Hola, buenos dias. Good morning. Um, I'm John Elkington. I'm going to chair the next session where, as Lucy has just said, we'll have people who are very directly involved in trying to drive change. But I just wanted to pick up one of the things that Lucy said, which was activism is a problematic word. I don't think it is. And I think Bella just got into it. We've got to redefine uh, activism. And one of the things I do is to try and help business leaders become activists. What's changed in recent years is there's a different generation of people coming up to run uh, companies uh, in different parts of the world. And we'll get into that, but not just business, uh, other parts of society uh, as well. I've got a wonderful panel uh, this morning. Which I think what I would like to do is invite them all up onto the stage. Uh, and that's my chair. Monsi, yours is the second chair. Delhi, yours is the fourth. Tim, yours is the third. Because your microphones are all sort of zoned in very clever ways. Thank you, Monsi. So listening to uh, uh, Lucy and Bella just now, it did strike me that I'm probably about five times their age. And if you have a spectrum of age, I'm, I'm sort of right at the other end. I'm 73. I've been 50 years working on environment and sustainability. But the strange thing is, I feel we're only just now getting started. Now it begins, and the world is really finally uh, waking up to the scale of the challenge that we uh, face. And like um, uh, our younger speakers, I, I've often been, if, if, if I got paid you know, a, a euro for every time I've been asked that question, are you optimistic, are you pessimistic? Do you have hope? Or do you not have hope? Uh, I, my answer is always very simple. I was born an optimist. You couldn't do what people like uh, the, our panelists do without actually believing the world can be better and that we can help uh, to make it better. And that, oddly at the moment, and Tim Smith and I were just talking about this uh, just before we started this morning, we're in an extraordinary period, and Kathy uh, very eloquently talked about this uh, moment where everything seems to be coming apart, and it is coming apart, and it needs to come apart, because the old order that we have inherited is simply not fit for purpose. And the question is then, what, how do we build the uh, new orders? And I think our theme this morning, as you will know, is biodiversity. So it's life in all its forms, and it's the way in which nature uh, not only supports us, but how over time we can actually better uh, support uh, the natural world. Now, in, in the business world where I mainly work, CEOs, business leaders now understand carbon. They get the decarbonization uh, agenda. They do not get the extinction agenda. They do not get the biodiversity um, uh, agenda as yet, uh, with some very honorable uh, exceptions. And there are many of them, particularly in the new technology sector, who think genetic engineering, synthetic biology, these sorts of things will um, uh, save us. That in a way, if nature's not good enough, let's improve nature. I think that's a very dangerous uh, way to uh, think about all of this. But what we will be talking about is things like ecosystem services, uh, about how you wild or rewild uh, nature. We have three extraordinary panelists, and I'm going to give each of them uh, some time to reflect on where we are on biodiversity, and critically, uh, in terms of our theme of restore, rewild, and regenerate, what they've learned in the work that they do, and what they would like to share uh, not only with the audience in this room, but people listening uh, online. So I'm going to start with Dr. Monse Villa uh, of the Doniana Biology uh, Station. And Monse, uh, immediately on my left, um, is a biologist, uh, uh, is, among other things, interested in, in invasive species. And if you think about invasive species, our own species is probably the most invasive species in, in the planet's uh, history, but she's also interested in pollination and ecosystem uh, services. So, Monsi, 
please, we'd love to hear about your thoughts on biodiversity. Good morning. Thank you for the presentation and thank you, Kathy and collaborators, for this invitation. I am very excited uh, about um, all this event. Um, I will switch to Catalan. Okay, let's see. So, while we're here, this is... Oh, let's see. Is it not moving? This is a video, real time, of the movement of the entire flow of goods and people around the world. Each dot represents $1 billion of goods and each color represents a type of good, plastics, wood, metal, and also food products, be they vegetable or vegetables or plants. And while we do this, in a direct or indirect manner, what we're doing is we are introducing exotic species, not coming from a different planet, species which go from one region to another. And here, as an example, we have the tiger mosquito, the carbobrotus plant that you may have seen on the coast, the catfish, American crab, uh, parrots, and this increase of new exotic invading species, and when I say invading invasive species, I mean species that expand very quickly and cause impacts that I will talk to you in a few minutes, then this increases. This very week, the El País Journal published uh, an article on two species that are concerning. One is an algae and the other one is the Asian hornet that they found here in Catalonia, the Asian hornet here in the port of Barcelona. So this is increasing. What are the introduction pathways? There are direct introduction pathways, such as, for example, many species which we introduce for hunting purposes and for fishing purposes, for recreational fishing. We introduce them on purpose into the wildlife. But there are also many species that we introduce, for example, as plants, ornamental plants, and when we clean up the gardens, we put all of the remains in natu into the natural species, we dump them into the natural world, and then they take root and they grow in nature. There are other species that we introduce as a pet, such as the Florida turtle. It's a, a small turtle, but they had never told us that it will grow very big, and then when it grows very big and it smells, we don't like having them at home, and we just dump them in nature, thinking that they will have a better life there, but two things may happen. One is that they will die, or the other one is they will expand. And then we also introduce other species accidentally. For example, when we do land uh, movements, when there's a lot of public work of a big magnitude, what we do is we transport seeds from one area to another. And we may also think of weeds, the plant species that are mixed with other agricultural, agricultural seeds. And another income route is the large infrastructures that connect different ecosystems. So, for example, transportation, transatlantic transportation from region to another. Other species may be stuck to the hull of the boats, uh, the, the ships, other species are in ballast waters that are used to compensate the weight of the ship in one region, but then they are dumped in another region. This is theoretically uh, forbidden to do at port. It should be done at sea, but it's not always done like that. And then we have large infrastructures such as the Suez Canal. 
And this is another thing that fascinates me because what these infrastructures do is they connect biomes that are very different. This is the Suez Canal. And here we have the number of species that have gone from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. They have made their way all the way to the Mediterranean. And as we can see in this picture, the, in red, we can see the number of exotic species in the sea as compared to local native species. And you see that in this area here, it is very high. It's not proportionately so high in the west coast, but it's a matter of time. Um, this is something that I asked yesterday to an expert, expert, Bella Galil, from Israel. I've been working with her for a long time. And I asked, how come not so many are in this area? And she said, it's a matter of time. There is a saline barrier here that prevents this species from dispersing. But due to climate change, this, the, the, this salt level, salinity level is increasing. And also because of the increase in, in the rising in sea temperatures. And these two factors are tropicalizing the Mediterranean Sea. And why are we concerned about this? This is not anecdotal. These invasions do not increase biodiversity. What they do oftentimes is they have impacts on biodiversity. Here you can clearly see an exotic invading species eating a native fish. It's a predator. And then we have other cases such as the American crab, which is an omnivore. It eats anything. It mixes the, the water where it lives and it completely changes the initial uh, native species. And another species here is this is a South African flower which is planted everywhere because it doesn't need much water. So in gardening now, it is a trend to use many species that you don't need to water so much. But what happens is that they have a high advantage versus other native species in very degraded ecosystems, such as in coastal areas. They create these uh, big extensions of um, this flower which compete with the native species. Also, carrots here in Barcelona, uh, maybe we're concerned about them because uh, they're dirty and make a lot of noise, but they have a great impact on biodiversity because they will compete with our other species for nests, uh, with other uh, species of bats or birds, bats which are great biotic controllers, such as, for example, uh, control populations of mosquitoes. It is difficult to, to conceive all of these, but many of these species change the nutrient cycle of the invaded areas. And we're all, we're also concerned because some of them may have an impact on the quality of water. And a um, very prominent case, for example, in the Modena River, is the invasion of the water hyacinth. This is a plant which looks really nice, it's beautiful, but it has invaded the Modena River and other ecosystems. It is very difficult to control. And what happens there? It forms these covers. And then water will not, or water, uh, sunlight will not cross it, and this generates changes in the biota of the river. And in other areas, it may also cause difficulties for sailing purposes. Impacts in infrastructures, the most well known uh, case is the case of these. Um, Zebra muscle and it populates uh, infrastructure such as cooling systems and we've spent lots of money trying to eliminate it and also with an with a species early detection system impact on agricultural productions we normally think of weed and, and pests and small insects or fungi or viruses and bacteria but we have very interesting cases such as the introduction accidental introduction of the the golden apple snail in aquaculture facilities. They need to eat a lot. They eat a lot of water plants, amongst them rice. 
So here at the Delta, we have a drop in rice production due to the invasion by the golden apple snail. And then there are other aesthetic impacts. Palm trees are exotic in and of themselves, but they're not invasive species. They cannot live where we planted them. But there was a, a, a batch of palm trees that had this insect that kills them and we are spending a lot of money on trying to make their death slower. But probably all palm trees will die at some point and we will need to plant another ornamental species. Impact on cultural facilities. There are pictures of Rome, a place where many studies have been conducted. Some of these uh, species degrade these historic monuments, these archaeological remains. And well, these are just, well, there are many more impacts. And then in public uh, health, many of these um, species are allergens and they flower earlier. And people who have hay fever, they are allergic for longer periods now. They, they suffer from the impacts of their hay fever for longer now. Another important impact on public health is that some of these species, such as diatomies and flagellates, create these red blankets red tides and this generates toxicity if we, for example, eat shellfish that has been in this area. And very important, some of the species which may be pets, such as the raccoon or this yellow-eared turtle, they cause zoonotic diseases. They are reservoirs for certain vector-borne diseases that can be transmitted to humans and we have also vectors such as the tiger mosquito. What can we do when we have one of the species already in place? We can try to control and eliminate it, but this is very difficult and costly and it oftentimes does not work. And what we have to try to do is like we do in public health. We need to try and prevent. We need to conduct risk analysis so that when we know that we want to introduce a species as an ornamental plant or a pet, we need to see whether they can become an invasive species or not. This is what is important to, to do. And it is also very important to do early detection. For example, there is an app where we can contribute as citizens to detect tiger mosquitoes. If we see one, we take a picture, we send it in, and then we can see whether where this species is expanding. It's very important to get involved. Not only they don't really have this system for tiger mosquitoes. There, there's this system exists for many of the species, and that will be all. Oh, thank you very much. Monse, thank you very much. I mean, I was thinking as you were presenting these different sorts of impacts that. Uh, introduced species, invasive species can have. And you mentioned health, and you mentioned um, ecological impacts, and so on. And you also mentioned the cultural mm -hmm. impacts. And I was just reflecting, in, in, in my own country, the United Kingdom, we've just lost a queen, obviously, and that has an impact on identity. But at the same time, we've been losing, for example, trees. The elm tree went first. Uh, we're now losing our chestnut trees. You know, we, we talk about conkers. We're losing the ash tree. And they're all because of invasive um, diseases of, of trees. And one of the questions I would ask you is, where in the world do you currently see, except for New Zealand, countries and their governments working in the, an effective way to deal with invasive species? Are there any good models? Well, the, the countries which are more uh, aware are the countries which are small and especially those that are uh, in remote areas, especially 
islands. Yeah, These are the countries which are really, really aware and they have these prevention measures and early detections. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for that. And let me now call up our next speaker and we'll come back to you in a moment. Thank you. Um, in 1977, a very long time ago, I went to see a very big hole in the southwest of um, England. It was an old China clay uh, quarry, and I was writing uh, about it for one of our magazines, New Scientist. And I looked at the sheer scale of this thing, and the idea that it could ever be regenerated, that it could ever become what the Eden Project is today, would have seemed completely uh, foreign. Uh, to me then. They were at that stage trying to do very small scale regenerative work. So there were these huge uh, heaps, mountains of sand and, 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 and waste material. And they were putting goats on that to sort of punch grass into the uh, sand. Very, very small uh, scale. Our next panelist, uh, Tim Smith, I should, I should reference the fact that he is Sir Tim Smith, but he doesn't style himself uh, that way, created one of the most extraordinary um, uh, developments with a sustainability theme that I've ever come across. It's called the Eden Project. Many of you may have visited it. Um, it has had something, last time I looked, over 20 million uh, visitors. Last time I looked, it put over a, a 1 billion pounds into the southwest uh, regional uh, economy. But much more than that, it's become one of these iconic examples of what can happen if individuals, teams of people, put their minds together and really aim uh, to regenerate the world. I just wanted to also thank um, Tim for something very particular he did quite a number of years ago. Any movement, whether it's the environmental movement, now the regenerative uh, uh, movement, uh, becomes competitive. People start to uh, compete with each other. And that certainly happened in the environmental movement, which is where uh, I largely came from. And Tim did this extraordinary thing of convening some of the early environmental campaigners and saying, why don't you bury the hatchet? Why don't you put aside those competitive pressures and work out how to uh, work together. And I think that invitation, that generosity of spirit, is something we need now because what we have is many different movements. They might be called human rights, they might be called circular economy, they might be called sustainability, they might be called regenerative economy. There are all of these different communities and they're all very often doing their own thing. How do we bring those uh, more effectively together? Because that is what we uh, need to do. But Tim, the floor is yours and, and the theme is very much up to you. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's not worth flying all the way to Barcelona and having a carbon footprint if I don't say some shocking things, is it? Look, I actually live, th believe we're living at the best of times since humans ever came out of the trees and went onto the savannas. I believe that our culture is actually really damaged at its heart because we have handed control of our culture to a bad race of storyteller. We are a storytelling species, Homo sapiens sapiens. So wise we named ourselves twice. <laughs> so what have we done? We're living in such good times that our brains are saying, fuck, if something goes wrong, we're not going to be prepared or trained to deal with it. We need to scare the wits out of ourselves. So we invented newspapers. And newspapers have got a rule. I don't know whether it's the same in Spain, but if it bleeds, it leads. It means that even my late mother believed that at the end of her road in the smartest part of England, there were crack dealers, there were murderers, there were people fly-tipping, and gypsies were just about to move in next door. Everything was evil. We are living in the most fantastic time. 
John is absolutely right to talk about the tech nerds who've got a complete misunderstanding of the way the world can heal itself. Anybody who works in the natural world knows that nature's quite good, actually. It's pretty, pretty cool. We don't need to improve on it. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the major problem we have, and I can only talk for Britain, except for at the G7 last year when they, the leaders of the G7 came to my project, the Eden Project, and it's so horrifying to meet people of such stunning mediocrity. Have you any idea how frightening it is to realize that these people that you've seen on a television all glammed up, you think they know things. And then they come and join you in a place and you're having a conversation with a glass of wine and your pinky in the air, and you realize all that they really know is what they've been told by the people closely around them the world that they think is evolving is a world that evolved probably 15, 20 years ago. They have no sense of the story or the future that still remains theirs to make. I had that Boris Johnson, you know. He was telling me that deep geothermal energy was quite interesting. I said, Prime Minister, are you aware that we have deep geothermal energy here at the Eden Project? We've spent 18 months digging five and a half kilometers towards the center of the world. Are you aware, Prime Minister, that every school child in Cornwall understands it's logical, it's bloody hot in there, so if you dig a hole, it's going to get hotter and hotter and hotter and you can get a lot of energy out of it. He said, well, what do you think the implications are? And I said, the implications, Prime Minister, are if I had your job, which I wish I did, I could make our nation energy independent with renewables by 2030, not by 2050. The problem is an absence of story. The problem why everybody is nervous and anxious and suffering from all stuff is no one is giving us a dream. Humans respond to the grounding of lightning, the belief that there's a nobility in the soul, the belief that there's a moral compass. How is it possible? How is it possible? We allow people to talk about whether our water should be clean, our air should be breathable, and our soil should remain fertile for future generations. How is it possible that is allowed to be a conversation that is left-wing or right-wing? It shouldn't be allowed. It's existential. No company in the world anywhere should be able to do anything that actually impacts on future generations. End of story. That is not anti-capital. <laughs> the reason the Eden Project has been such fun has been that we took a whole bunch of pretty ordinary people, many of them members of the awkward squad, the people we now jokingly call nerds, put them together, and started dreaming about what great could look like. We met a guy who had been in a laboratory in Reading messing around with soil, who reckoned he could create soil. So we said, could you make 90,000 tons of soil? He said, you're kidding. I said, no. And you know what? He made 90,000 tons of soil, the biggest contract for soil manufacture the world has ever seen. I asked, with these soils, is it possible that we could grow a selected range of the plants on which we depend from all over the world. We got this amazing horticultural team from all over the world. Bear in mind, they had been turning up at motorway service stations and pubs for 18 months with no money. I didn't pay them anything. I didn't have the money. Why did they come? Because the dream of something amazing electrified them. Every person in this audience would love to be involved in an adventure that was bigger than themselves, that linked them into a story of living at a moment of a new green enlightenment, which is where I believe we are. Isn't it amazing, though? In just 18 months, we created 90,000 tons of soil. We brought in 6,000 various species of the plants on which humans are dependent. And we asked the architects to build the first conservatories ever built that weren't a monument to the vanity of architects. Our biomes, they're the biggest in the world. They're 57 meters high, 18,500 square meters across one of them. The other is a half of that. But that's not really the point. The point is, as it was getting built, can you imagine constructors standing on it wanting to be photographed with it? Can you believe a gang of Hell's Angels coming because one of their number was actually a fitter 
And I came there one Saturday, and there's a guy playing the saxophone, 57 meters up, strapped a bit of metal, with a whole gang of Hell's Angels just punching the air. And they all came to the opening ceremony. No celebrity, just the people who'd worked on it. Our main education building bears the hallmarks of everybody who's worked on it. Their handprints are in the, in the tiles that have been made. It's about person. It's about emotion. It is about dreaming. It is not about corporate structure and a process. And when we talk about corporates, John and I often have to have an extra glass of wine because it does make you a bit ill. I mean, when you bear in mind that your carbon footprint was invented by BP to make us all feel guilty, I wonder whether people have heard of plants. You know those green things? They're fucking amazing plants, really. Let me tell you about plants. We have a 10,000 acre reserve in Costa Rica, which was completely degraded. It was farmland, it was bought by a guy called Pedro Kölind, a, 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 a Danish um, fire alarm maker, um, which is a bit ironic. He bought 10,000 acres of farms so degraded they could hardly grow anything. He put a fence around it, he said, no human beings in here for 15 years. After 15 years, people can come in. Why? Because the birds will shit it back to life. <laughs> and you know what? The birds did shit an awful lot. Today, there is a 10,000 dry, this sounds a bit complicated, it's a dry forest. It's some of the rarest forest in the world. The biodiversity is amazing, and every single year it is improving. Of course, you've got the big, the big glamour ones that we like. We have these... Um, uh, infrared lights in, in the jungle now. And, you know, last year we had Jaguar Arena and Ocelot. Yeah, you know. And then this year we've had Jaguar for the first time. And we've now persuaded Hotel Chocolat to come and we're going to grow a huge amount of wild cacao, the profits from which going through Hotel Chocolat are going to enable us to buy a lot more land to turn back to wild to create a wider corridor for the wildlife. But you know, the most amazing thing I've seen probably in my life as an environmentalist was going to the town of Paquera. 8,000 people in this town in, in, Costa, uh, in Costa Rica, right next to this formerly awful place. And the mayor made a speech in front of a whole, I uh, must have been thousands of people, about Matambu, which is our reserve. He said, do you know what it feels like? Every year from when I was 20, looking up at the mountains, when at a certain time of the year the mountain would shimmer, the heat, and I felt the knot in my stomach, the fear that what was coming was the great drought. Every year, five months of drought, there would be murders, the stock would die, the land would be degraded. Do you know what it feels like today? I look up those mountains, we all look up at those mountains, and they start to shimmer. And then you look closely and you see its moisture coming off the rainforest. It's moisture and you see the clouds forming above the mountains and then it rains. Just 15 years ago, no water, zero water flowed out of that rainforest, now forest area, for five months of the year. Today, in a very short time, very short time, four rivers, four, are flowing in full torrent for 12 months of every year. The land is blessed. All humans did was to just not do anything for a while and to trust that nature and ecological systems have an amazing healing power. That is why we built the Eden Project. That's why we dug a hole five miles, five kilometers deep. That's why we're gonna dig a lot more of them because we all need a dream. And actually, humans with a dream can do almost anything. That is why, when I saw Bella and Lucy start off, I was a bit cross. A, because they're so young, damn you! B, you're so good. And C, I hated the fact that we introduced you as young as if being young was a virtue, as if we, the older... Oh, how patronizing, they're young environmentalists. Isn't it sweet? No, bloody good on you. You're great, and you're doing stuff that a lot of us should have done a long time ago, and we're very proud of you, by the way. <laughs> so...
So just to finish, inside every person in here, I've discovered there's something we all have in common. And I thought about this two days ago when someone said something amazing about rock music. I, I used to be in the music industry, and the, the guy who's the singer with Pearl Jam was being interviewed about why he liked pl playing in public so much. And he thought about it, and he gave the best answer, but I'd never heard anyone give it before. He said, do you know what it's like standing up and performing to 45,000 people that agree with each other? It's a lovely thought, isn't it? So I think I'd leave that with you. Isn't it great to be in a room with a whole bunch of people who agree with each other? And let's pledge ourselves not to clean up plastic. The state should clean up plastic. We should just get angry with people who don't clean up plastic. Why are we taking responsibility? I just want to throw that in there like a, a little, you know, you, you were starting to like me, I could tell there was that warmth. So I thought, I thought we'll soon damage that, you know. It's a really interesting thing about those things we don't hold our society to account to sort out for and those things we really ought to be protecting like the soil because future generations are going to be screwed if we don't. I just think we need to hold on to that. So, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference with my splendid chums, new chums, and uh, go home believing that there is another sapiens in your life, the wise bit, and you're going to embark on an adventure. And don't make it a proxy adventure. Make an adventure that makes the blood course through your veins. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, Tim, don't think you're going to get away. Um, a couple of questions. But before I do it, Don McClark just came into the audience uh, uh, a moment ago, and I just wanted to reflect on the way in which there are a growing number of businesses that are embracing uh, resilience, restoration, regeneration. Uh, Don is from a company called Vivo Barefoot, uh, and they are very much in, uh, footwear and, and, and very much into the regeneration story. So I have two questions to you. The first is, you talked about electrifying dreams, as you're setting up Eden projects in lots of different places around the world now, you mentioned Costa Rica, but there are many others. Do people dream the same dreams? And how do you, how do you sort of get them onto the same sort of dream page once you're doing that? And then just picking up the reference to Dilma, how much interest, I mean, the world comes to you at Eden, but do you go out to the world and, for example, you mentioned the G7 uh, politicians, uh, they came to you also, but do you take your message out to business, for example? And if so, what sort of response are you getting in that sort of world? And not just from the Vivo Barefoots, but the giants. No, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very pro-business. I'm just very anti no moral compass. Yeah. I hate the fact that business has allowed itself to be discussed as if it was a social class. And that I think that has led to especially middle-aged men having a loyalty to each other which they should have broken years ago and actually just said, that's just not acceptable. How on earth can you invite a guy from a big water company that's putting shit into the water for all of us to dinner? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Why? Who are these guys? You know, they're, 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 I, I don't believe we ought to have an ounce of sympathy for someone who owns half, earns half a million or more a year for putting shit into our water. I think that's a really lousy job, don't you? I do. <laughs> And it's interesting, there's a book that's just come out looking at uh, billionaires in the tech industry and how they all want to go off to New Zealand or Patagonia and build bunkers and they're taking advice from specialists on how best to do that because they can see the implications of what they're collectively doing but they're not yet prepared to uh, act at the sort of scale and with the, the urgency that would be needed but how beyond not inviting people to dinner, Tim, do you get people to act? in those sorts of worlds. All right. If you believe, as I do, that it is possible for us to have almost unlimited renewable energy within a very short period yeah. of time, if you believe, as I do, that through 3D printing you will be br breaking down supply chains globally to be able to have everything local, if you believe, as I do, that the muscular localism which is in the air right now is going to actually become an epidemic when everybody realizes you don't <laughs> need central anything, I think you suddenly realize that business is going to take on a completely new form, yeah. a sort of service industry of ideas to provide that which people require. 
That's one of the good things about the pandemic. It meant that people realized that, that national boundaries were a joke, but also how dependent they were on people who live near them. And I think yeah. the loyalty has continued. I think most people are asleep at the wheel in terms of the revolution that's coming towards. Within 15 years, you're going to see um, a, a, a fermentation technology. I mean, you've talked about that in, in Green Swan. You're going to see fermentation technology, uh, 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 clean meat, all of those things at scale. You're going to see electric vehicles driven by much more intelligent life than is currently the case, uh, normal drivers, um, and you'll be able to rip it. If I was giving any of you really rich people in the audience, there must be at least one, right? <laughs> if, if, you're really, if you were really, really rich, what you should do is to go to the most, if you were living in Barcelona, go to the most ugly roads with nice houses on them, which have got fumes and everything else. Buy property. In five years' time, there's going to be no fumes, no noise. It's going to be wonderful. Worse, I mean better, you won't need so many lanes because you'll be able to dig them up because the cars are going to be driven well. You know, you, you, you really well because they're not driven by humans. So you'll be able to have really big gardens as well. The other thing is, walk around Barcelona and work out how many plants you could plant in Barcelona. It is astonishing. Just imagine every yeah. city in the world was planting the amount of plants you could plant in Barcelona. Work out how clever plants are. Think about my Matambu project in Costa Rica. And you think, is carbon such a problem? Or has it been invented for us by accountants because they can count that? I say that only as a speculative thing. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. We're about to move on to the, uh, to the question of rewilding. But just a quick, since Tim raised cities, uh, there's a group in uh, the United States called the Smart Surfaces Coalition. And part of what they're doing is looking at how you bring cities into that regenerative game as well. So for example, one of the problems if you do plant trees in cities, just in the United States alone, 36 million urban trees die every year just because the conditions are not suitable. So smart surfaces are actually looking at the question, how do you not only bounce solar energy back into uh, space by pa painting uh, roofs white, but they're looking at how you make car parks, if you still have those, uh, roads and so on, uh, reflective. But even more interestingly, how do you bring plants back and keep them alive? Green roofs and all, all, all the rest of it. So um, our next panelist um, is in that fascinating space of rewilding, which has just been coming up exponentially uh, in uh, recent years. And, and Deli Saavedra uh, is head of landscapes at Rewilding uh, Europe. So Rewilding Europe, if you don't know them, they go from Portugal through to Bulgaria. They do fascinating work. And when Deli and I were talking yesterday evening at the Hidden Factory, we were just talking about impact and how you start to measure some of the extraordinary uh, positive impacts that come from uh, a model uh, like uh, theirs. I just want to say one quick thing about Deli. I mean, his sense is that we are not trying with rewilding to take things back to a past, a glorious past or whatever. But instead, we're trying to co-evolve a future which works very much uh, better, in which we will then look at a range of different positive impacts spraying out from all of that. But Delhi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me get this. Thank you, John, for the introduction. Thank you, Kaf, for the invitation to this fantastic festival. I'm going to speak in Catalan. First of all, I would like to repeat what um, Katy uh, already said in the morning. I guess you all know this, but not the people from outside. We are facing an existential crisis, a multiple crisis, and uh, climate uh, crisis, pandemic, loss of biodiversity, and. Uh, What's most important is that we all have the solutions clear in our mind. We have to stop using fossil fuels. We need to protect the nature that is left and we have to restore the maximum amount of nature that we can. And a minimum of half of the planet 
and uh, half of the planet has to be devoted to nature. It seems uh, easy, but we also have to do it in a fair and equitative way so that uh, a part of the population doesn't uh, uh, suffer the crisis uh, while the others don't. And then in rewilding, we try to do a restoration of nature so that uh, we can put the different pieces that are lacking in our ecosystems so that nature is resilient and can adapt to climate change. And basically what we want is to put nature uh, in charge of everything. So we think that we have uh, uh, to cut and sow and do uh, everything, but no, nature does not need us for anything. Thing. Nature can do everything, so nature has to be in charge of everything and we have to be the co-pilot. So nature is going to be the pilot and we have to be the co-pilot because nature knows what to do. And as uh, John said, it's not only to look back in the past, rewilding is not uh, thinking how was nature 500 years ago, let's copy it, not at all. Uh, science looks at the past uh, to know how the ecosystems were, but we look into the future. The future is going to be different, uh, one degree, one degree and a half is going to change a lot of things. We have to be aware of that and we need big natural spaces that are resilient and diverse and uh, this is also what we do in rewilding restoring and uh, one of the key uh, pieces of rewilding that is also very important is the refaunation so so recovering the ski species the fauna into the ecosystems which are the key species and uh, George Orwell said that all species are the same but there are others that are more the same than others and these are the key species the ones that have an important impact on ecosystems that they engineer so so to say the ecosystems they keep and improve these ecosystems and now we know that these key species and normally megafauna we call them they are also important because these uh, ecosystems can absorb more carbon and this is one of the main things we have to do stop um, releasing uh, carbon and store the maximum amount of carbon that we can I can give you examples, the news in the Serengeti ecosystem and uh, these uh, um, grasslands, uh, the most important species is new, and, uh, but uh, its uh, population was decreased during the beginning of the 20th century with cattle and uh, there were only 300,000 and uh, what happened? Well, this grassland that was not eaten was growing. And uh, then there were a lot of wildfires uh, burning the grasslands and the trees uh, in the savanna. And then the ecosystem of the Serengeti uh, started releasing CO2. And the number of news has uh, increased. We have more than one million news. And the ecosystem has changed completely. The grass is short. And the plants store the carbon in their roots of the soil. And nowadays, this ecosystem is is a storage of uh, uh, carbon and it stores uh, the uh, emissions uh, of Tanzania and Kenya all together. So it's great news and a uh, way to um, make an ecosystem that was emitting uh, CO2 in an ecosystem that stores CO2. Another example would be the ocean and uh, it would be something similar. The fish, big fish and whales, they eat uh, these uh, phytoplankton, the algae, and uh, with uh, its droppings, the carbon uh, goes uh, to the bottom of the ocean. And what these uh, fish do, free, it's uh, storing all 
Well, these would be two times the emissions of the uh, un of the European Union for two years. Amazing amount of CO2 being stored. And uh, what we do is uh, to fish them in an intensive way. And uh, most of the fisheries are in danger with very low populations of fish. And what's uh, even sadder is that there is a um, research that said that from the 50s up to now, half of the fisheries were not feasible. And uh, they continued because of the subsidies. So we have uh, subsidized the destruction of the fauna that could help us fight the climate change. And we need to protect 30% of the oceans in 2030 minimum. And then we have to prohibit these big intensive fisheries. And also we need to ban um, these uh, drugging uh, fisheries and uh, the uh, trawling and uh, because uh, the CO2 is emitted again. So this trawling uh, fishing has the same emissions as uh, the global aviation all over the world. And we have another example of the wolf in uh, ecosystems uh, that help to uh, store CO2, but I don't have time. And uh, what happens in Europe and uh, these examples are global examples and Europe there is a very interesting situation there is an abandonment of the land and the last uh, uh, century this is a picture of the Alps at the beginning on the 20th century and there were people everywhere as you can see why is that because we needed to produce food, population was increasing, and every area on the marginal had to devote themselves to agriculture and farming. A few years later, a completely different picture, abandoned towns, abandoned farming land, and this is really significant in Europe between the year 2000 and 2030, 13,000 square kilometers would be abandoned. This is the surface area of Italy. So it's a huge area. Many people, politicians, leaders see these as a very severe problem. Those of you from around here, I'm sure you've heard about the MT Spain, the problem uh, related to people going from the land to the cities. But we can see it in a different manner too. We can see this as an opportunity. Actually, if a century ago the main priority of Europeans was producing food for a growing population, at the beginning of the 21st century, the first concern, the top concern of Europeans is storing carbon and protecting nature, have the energies devoted to nature. So let's use these spaces and sp spaces and devote them to nature. But it's not enough. It's not enough to say, okay, we just uh, leave it to its own devices because even us in Mediterranean ecosystems in the south of Europe, we know that if these ecosystems, this agricultural land is just left alone, what happens is it burns. And wildfires in the south of Europe are a severe problem from the ecological, social, and economic point of view. And there is also a paradoxical situation, which is that for the first time in European history in many thousands of years, maybe millions of years, we do not have animals, we don't have large animals, because for many years in Europe there were big herds of uh, deer, rhinos and others, and our ancestors killed them all, and, and they brought their animals, domestic animals, millions of cows, horses, donkeys, sheep, uh, but now for the first time in many European landscapes out of these 300,000 square kilometers that I was talking about, there's nothing, there's, there are no large herbivores, there are none of these key species that can model and make these ecosystems more diverse and resilient. So what should we do? What we should do is bring them back here. Some of them no longer exist, a wild horses no longer exist, we drove them into extinction, but we have many primitive uh, breeds such as these uh, horses that do not need additional food or shelter, they can defend themselves uh, from wolves and we can reintroduce them in these landscapes for these ecologic uh, functions to eat the grass, to create space with their 
experiments to create space for insects, for example, and this is done by nature alone. It doesn't need us. What we need to do is we need to get this fauna come back at a large scale. A very positive history is that of the European uh, buffalo, and there were 29 left a few years ago. They were almost extinct, and now we have 9,000 all over Europe. But 9,000 is still a ridiculous figure. Europe is very large, and we need reintroduction projects to bring the European bison into areas that need these landscape engineer or architect. And just a couple more things, just to finish, if the clicker will work. This leads me to a very interesting thing. This naturalize these landscapes where we've done this rewilding task, places that are abandoned with an aging population, with scarce financial resources, they can become natural spaces so that people, citizens, most of us are citizens, we live in cities in Europe, so that we can enjoy nature. And the uh, fauna, observation, photography, adventure, uh, businesses, all of these businesses, all of this new economy based on nature, will only grow. And it can be a driver, a financial driver for these deprived areas. Not this nostalgic idea of bringing people back to the land. This won't happen. No one wants to be a shepherd in a remote mountain anymore. But we need to get these new activities that will bring a new economy into these areas. And just to finish, because I think I have three minutes left, a couple of uh, small points. One is coexistence. Biophilia, let's relax with fauna. These people are very happy here in Berlin, seeing a family of boars, and in well, Barcelona, some neighborhoods, they're not so happy with them, but this is about management. It comes down to management. We want fauna, and what is more exciting when you walk through the woods than knowing that in some place, even if you don't see them, there may be a wolf, a bear, or a deer hiding, instead of walking through a uh, forest where the largest thing you can find is squirrel and this is very important in terms of our relationship with nature and last idea i've talked about big spaces large spaces where you can it seems like you can only do rewilding in, in very large spaces but rewilding works everywhere do it in your garden instead of having a boring artificial patch of grass full of pesticides that you uh, cut every two weeks why don't you have a field full of flowers and insects and bees and, and birds that will come eat the seed that's much more interesting ask your town uh, to your your mayors your deputy mayors to have re-naturalized uh, spaces so that we can enjoy nature in our cities on a daily basis and just to finish I love this craft we did with Rewilding Europe, thanks to a wonderful Dutch artist. And I always love finishing my talks with this because I think for a long time, for the longest time, nature and us were together. And then at some point, we were so smug so as to think that we could drift away from nature, we could separate from the biosphere, and we could go on our own path. And now, with the crisis, the multiple crises that we are facing, we've seen that this is not the way it is. Nature will survive without us, but we will not survive without nature. So it is time, as I said before, to protect and restore as much as we can. And in the end, well, just a call. I, will, I was going to say to, to young people, but I don't want team to tell me off. So to everyone, old and young, I would like to call you on to work, to call you all to work on this. We need thousands of electricians, for example, for the revolution of renewables. We also need thousands of rewilders for the revolution of rewilding in Europe and all over the world. So a lot of strength and, and success in your efforts. Thank you, Deliana. You mentioned right towards the end of your uh, presentation, biophilia, the love of life, the love of wildlife, and so on. One of the things that I think is a challenge is that our species is becoming an urban species. So half of it plus now lives in cities. They say within a decade or two, something like 70% of human beings will live in cities. Various people have already referenced, Lucy among them, um, how you know, being exposed to uh, wildlife early in life is a very 
important trigger in what they then decide to do, what they become in a way. How do we, and this is perhaps a question to you, but to all of you, how do we counter that, um, that trend by getting more people out into nature in ways that really do, do help switch them on, but without saturating nature, without damaging nature, and so in, in different ways, I mean, in Cote Daniana or in, in the Eden Project or in, across Europe, you're all, in a way, having to deal with that uh, issue. How, how do we do that well, and how, how do you do it? In particular, well, I, I think we should do it in different levels. Um, in, for example, in rewilding Europe, what we try to do is to bring the people from the cities and, in general, yeah. to the rewilding areas. But of course, we are so we are promoting the tourism. We also know that uh, tourism is not the only way, and we saw it during the pandemic in Africa. You cannot just put all your eggs into yeah, we will have a tourist economy. So we need something more diversified. But I think still to bring people to the more remote areas. Uh, it's not going to be yeah. enough. So we need to bring nature back to the cities. And as I said uh, before, I think what we need is to turn our, our cities, uh, our parks, our gardens into, we have to do the rewilding. The main rewilding needs to be on our cities because, yeah. you know, people had this, and it's been told as a disease, not this uh, natural deficit disorder. People need nature. And if, and, and if they don't get nature, they have all kinds of mental issues. And it will not be enough to promote our groups of photographers in going into the nature. We need to bring nature back into the cities in yeah. every square meter. Yeah. Thank you. Ponce, how, yeah. how do you deal with this issue? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I also, I also think that um, it's clear that people need nature. And we have yeah. seen that with the pandemics. Even people who never went uh, to outside now they do because yeah. they realize that i mean to be on concrete is not healthy um, but of course we also have seen uh, areas which are very saturated like in the pyrenees so of course like from the protection point of view they have been setting caps of people yeah. being able to go but and i also agree that we have to bring nature to cities Something that it happens to me when I come back to Barcelona all the time, I think, how come this city doesn't have more uh, green spaces? I mean, it's impressive. Why not? And it could, right? I mean, we could remove all the concrete from all these uh, yeah. squares and, and make them more, yeah, more healthy. I would say healthy, not um, natural, but healthy to the people. And does your work involve you working in cities as well, or is this just when you come to cities, you think about that? Well, indeed, now I have a project uh, working on ornamental plants in urban areas, because mm. this is also where many exotic species are introduced, and from them they escape and are invasive. Okay. But, so we have to be very careful about what we plant and what we uh, put us species in the urban areas. Yeah. And Tim, I mean, Eden wouldn't exist if you didn't have uh, a good model for bringing people in large numbers into a relatively small space still and, and exposing them to nature in a sort of fairly controlled way. How, how do you manage that? And what have you learned over time with, with, with Eden about how that's best done? Well. I learned it first with my first adventure, which was the Lost Gardens of Heligan. Yeah. Um, Could you say a little bit for people about it? So the Lost Gardens of Heligan was an estate that went to sleep in 1915 when all the gardeners enlisted in the First World War and three quarters of them died. And the guy who owned the estate was so sad that he put a fence around the garden and no one went in there again until I went in there in 1990. And we restored the gardens in order to tell the story of the ordinary men and women who'd made these gardens great, rather than the story of the lords and ladies. It was a, a blue-collar story. And people came. And if you were to ask me what is the proudest thing in my entire life, it would be, I'm, I'm talking professionally, it would be that more than 400 people have chosen to have their ashes scattered in this garden, because it means a lot to them. And I think this is something that we, 
we don't talk about it very much, especially in Britain. We're bad with religion, we're bad with spirituality. We pretend that we're not talking about it when we talk about poetry and romance and music and beauty. And actually, we've got to come to terms with the fact that even if you are not religious, I do not have the comfort of a religion, there is something deeply needy in all of us uh, to a sense of belonging. For example, we have a, a, a doctor that's quite famous in Britain now for what is called social prescription. And he made the most brilliant speech. He, he's a doctor and he said, I don't mind if my patients smoke. I don't care really if they drink a lot or they take drugs because by a factor of more than a hundred times more people die as a direct consequence of loneliness and a lack of a sense of belonging than any of those. And I think we've got to be very wise to the fact that the work that you two are, 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 are so brilliantly doing um, is actually just putting a toe in the water of reconnecting us to who we are. And the problem is if we trivialize it as if it was a leisure experience, oh look, we've got bison and foxes and wolves that we can look at, that trivializes it. But actually getting a sense that you're somehow connecting yourself back to the past into a present, which has got a, a hopeful future, I think is, is really important. And I, someone has yet to write a book about that, but there is something profoundly spiritual going on in everybody, but we can't yet voice it. Sorry, that's a very long-winded answer, nice. but that is why we built Eden, not in London. We built it 287 miles from London, because I was certain, I was absolutely certain that if I'd built something like that in London, it wouldn't have succeeded. It would have been, people would have responded to it like a leisure thing, for your appetite, I'll go and do that. Whereas if you've driven for five hours and you've got to get in a queue and then you've got to go into a pit, it's more like a pilgrimage. So people yeah. actually go away with a sense of pilgrimage. And I think that's what you two are doing, is trying to create places of biological pilgrimage. I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask whether there are questions or comments uh, from the audience. But just as I do that, um, can I just uh, say something and then ask something of the panel? Different land uses or changing land uses, for example, taking agricultural land back to nature, that's political, whether we like it or not. It, it, there's a politics around that. And Delhi, across Europe, how do you deal with those politics? Because they must be there. Do you have politically trained people who go there and you parachute them in to sort out all of the local people and then let the wolves loose? <laughs> well, I have to say that we work mainly with the local people, so we have local teams yeah. and we work always local, but I can tell you something. The main competence, the main competition for rewilding, the main difficulty for rewilding are cap subsidies, driven mm. by European Union. So when I go to a place and I, and I ask and I uh, propose our stakeholders, hunters, farmers to do something different, to do rewilding, they say, wow, what a fantastic idea, but what, sorry, I'm getting 500 uh, euros per hectare for mowing or for destroying bushes from Brussels, from the European Union, so sorry, I cannot do that. So that's the main problem, and it's political, of course. We have yeah. to change cap subsidies completely, because we are paying people to destroy nature, and we have to do exactly the opposite. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. Thank you. And, 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 and Monsieur, with the work that you're doing, you described um, the science of invasive species. You have to, at some point, deal with politicians, political people, persuade them to do something different. Who, in your world, is responsible for doing that political work? Do you do some of that, or is it done by other people? No, we, we have worked a lot. I mean, the scientific community in Europe has worked a lot to have a regulation, yeah. and also in Spain. But this is not enough, because I think that even like, the general citizens are not very aware of it. Um, it's not a major priority compared to climate change or many other issues. Yeah. But I would say that um, this is the biological invasions area, is one field where scientists have been out of academia and work with educators and different stakeholders and politicians to do something. Yeah. yeah. 
Thank you. Let me just see if there are any uh, questions or comments. I have a question. I don't know if well I can, can I talk in Catalan? Please. Yes, yes. Can I talk in Catalan? Yes. Oh. Ah. <laughs> okay, better. Thank you. You talked about the needs to rewild cities, but one of the big problem is, problems is cost, at least here, the cost of gardening in a climate such as in the Mediterranean climate. So I don't know if there should be training or intense counseling for municipalities to plant the adequate species of plants so that all of this maintenance is not so extremely costly because this is one of the great problems that we encounter. I don't know. Oh, sorry. I'll answer in Catalan then. It is a matter of priorities. A city invests in design, in lighting, in green areas, so it is a matter of priorities. Obviously, having a pool of gardeners is costly, but I don't see the concern really. Well, the priority is priorities and awareness raising because at the end of the pandemic the town councils uh, were weeding the streets and up using pesticides for everything to be clean they said clean so let's change our priorities thank you any other thoughts in the gods john in the gods <laughs> oh is it all right <laughs> thank you <laughs> i have a question for each of you actually um so I'll switch languages uh, for Monse. Um, no podem introduir depredadors. For Monse, can we not introduce natural predators? Because I saw this was not one of the options. I guess it's difficult, but I would like to understand why we cannot face these invasive uh, species with their natural predators. I understand they come from an area where they live in a balance, so there must be a predator. I don't know if it would be possible to introduce those predators here. Why do you think it's so hard to get other areas in the world, even if, I don't know, I'm thinking about Catalonia, um, we're relatively small or very small. Um, we do have areas where we could go and do nothing for a while. In your experience, why is it so hard for to convince people to just do nothing? No, there's many people that own land to different scales, like the gardens that you were mentioning. Why is it that, you know, even individual owners cannot just stay put for a bit? Um, and to Delhi, um, how is the rewilding How do you do large-scale rewilding? If you want to reintroduce bisons, where do you get them from? That may be a very basic question, but where do all of these bisons come from? Can they be raised, or are these stocks that come from elsewhere, or herds that come from elsewhere? Yes, you talked about biologic, uh, biological control. It's a type of control that consists of introducing a predator, for example, a parasite of a plant. In Europe, it is not allowed or is not well regarded. This is done in Australia, the US, New Zealand, but it's not easy or trivial, it comes with problems too. Despite the tests done, and it takes years to do the right tests, it is not always successful, and oftentimes these predators end up being invasive species. But on some occasions, on some, in some cases, I, I am sure that it's the only way. For example, in the highest centers that I mentioned before, there's a very specific predator, and it's the only thing that has worked, for example, in Lake Victoria. Okay, um, I was once asked by a, a newspaper what made great gardens and why should we preserve them? And I answered as follows. If you can't dream in them, if you can't get drunk, if you can't fall in love and make love in them, tarmac them. <laughs> I think uh, there is an assumption that we naturally like the natural world. A lot of people, the majority of people, might need to be coached into how to enjoy it and how to feel safe in it. I mean, the three of us can walk into pretty much anywhere, and unless there's a bear right in front of us, 
we're going to feel pretty safe, you know. And even him with a bear, he'd probably be feeling safe as well. <laughs> but, the, the, but I think there is, there is a hunger out there for perhaps interpreting the wild in a way which becomes like a love child between urban culture and um, wild renewal. And a lot of people are talking about that. I mean, if you go to some of the more humanly uh, rewilded places like NEP and places like that, there is a definite sense of the romance of restoration and the, you know, we all like kissing frogs. That's what we do. We kiss frogs and it's really exciting. And then there's a princess or a prince in front of you. And I think the appreciation of the wild needs, it needs curation for a lot of people. And that's what you do, isn't it? You, you're exactly. a curator. You're a curator, yeah. making people, making it legible. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if I may, and it's also the shifty baselines. So we go to nature, and this poor nature, completely impoverished, we think that it's normal, and it's not normal, and mm. we have to show that. Answering your question, so there are translocations, you can find herds in a place where they are very abundant and take them to another space. And in Europe, many of these species, wild horses, cows, are considered legally domestic animals and legally there are a series of veterinary requirements and this makes things more difficult. It's very important but it's also more difficult to, to recuperate wild animals that legally are domestic animals. And after the CAP subsidies, which is the first problem, the second problem is bureaucracy everywhere. Europe loves red tape and we have the European, the Spanish, the Catalan bureaucracy, municipal bureaucracy, as much bureaucracy, bureaucracy as you can get. Thank you. Thank you all three. Um, we have, by the clock, just over five minutes uh, left. So what I'm going to do is, is, is say something, and then I'm going to turn to the panel and ask them each a question, the same question. And Delhi is what, y y what you've just said about normal, normality, is what triggered this thought. And I was saying to Monsi when I first met her this morning that what started me off, what, what made me what I am in many ways, was a very shocking experience which I had when I was six. And I was in Northern Ireland, I was on my own, it was very dark, um, and I suddenly found myself in the middle of something that would not happen now. It's not, it was normal then, it's not normal now. There were tens of thousands of baby eels Anguilas, uh, sort of uh, elvers, we would call them. And I, I, was, I went into complete shock because I, I, I was a child and I had no idea what was going on. I didn't, and I put my fingers down and these things were crawling between my fingers. And then something happened which, which was very, very powerful and it's only afterwards I understood it. I suddenly felt connected to a wider world, which in, in a sense that's never... Uh, left me. And the reason I mention that is because with very rare exceptions, younger people do not now have that uh, experience. And I think it's so critically important that over time that they do. And there's a bridge point. There's a horrible phrase in English, it's scientific, which is shifting benchmark syndrome, which means that you get used to a changing normal. So for example, when I moved to my, the, the area of London where I live in 1975, at night the street lamps were completely surrounded by insects, thousands of them. And that there were things called stag beetles. I remember one evening counting 50 of those beetles flying against a, a bedroom window. You don't see any insects now. And yet people who move to that part of London, that part of that city, and it's true in most other cities, they think it's a beautiful community. They think it's a beautiful urban environment. They don't have any sense of that uh, loss. So my question to all three of you, we've suddenly seen some very large companies moving into the regener gener regeneration space. So for example, Walmart, God help us. Uh, no, I think they're semi-serious. Doug McMillan, their CEO, has said he wants 
uh, Walmart to become a regenerative company. PepsiCo, Unilever, all of these companies are coming into this space. The likelihood is they will do, whether they intend or not, what has happened to sustainability. Sustainability had teeth when it started, and it's become increasingly diluted as it mainstreams. How do we make sure that people who commit to restoration, to regeneration, to rewilding, are doing what we assume that they will be doing? Any ideas uh, on that would be very welcome. Monse, can I start with you? Oh, so <laughs> well, I think that you have to be more concerned that resources are limited yeah. to start with. You have to have a better appreciation about what nature gives you. Um, this is to start. Well, I think part of, part, part of why I admire so much what you do and people like you do is that you are developing science and tomorrow's science in a way. And I think one of the things that we've all got to do is become, we've got to understand science and understand what science is telling us much more. And I think, you know, part of what you're doing here today is, is, is explaining that emergent science, and thank you for it. And I think that as scientists we have to approach people more often. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and learn how to explain the science in another language. Yeah. Totally agree. And now I'm going to be a grasshopper, and I'm going to jump over to, okay. to Delhi. Well, so many things we can do. So, for example, um, of course, as consumers, we have to do something. And every day we have to do something. We have our choices, and, and that's very important. I think that more and more of these 2,470 billionaires are getting into, in, in, into the into the feeling that they need to do much more. So I think uh, very soon money is not going to be really a, a, the problem. I think the problem is, is a political problem, so it's, it's about politicians and all the lobbies they, ha they have uh, behind. Why do we, have, we don't have insects? Because we have all this intensive agriculture with these plaguicides and, pe and pesticides using every day. Because, and they are using them because someone is allowed them to use them, mm -hmm. and those are the politicians. We can change that. Yeah. In the moment that the politicians and the laws are changing this, and they are not listening more to the lobbies, but they're listening to the people, this will change. And I can tell you that, for example, there are already lots of companies, that uh, tractor companies, that they are preparing all this machinery for no tillage, for example. And the moment that Europe says no plowing anymore, all these companies are, the technology is ready. They are, yeah. But they are not going to yeah. sell it until they don't, uh, they don't ask the farmers. Europe is saying, the farmers, sorry, now there's no more plowing. There's because you are just emitting carbon into the atmosphere. Now it will be only no tillage. And everyone is ready for that. So we have to ask our politicians, and we have to be sure that those lobbies behind yeah. behave, and we change all this. So a lot of work. Let's do it. Fantastic, yep. Delia. And we, Tim, we've got two minutes and nine seconds, and I want at least some of that. So what's your answer? My answer is that the, the worst criminals should be stripped naked and put in cages and hung over the main access streets into cities. <laughs> um, and I think that would be very popular. I think we've got to consider whether our soft liberal approach to the way we police the environment has failed, and therefore we like Singapore, despite the fact we don't like it, become much more stern with ill performance. And I'd like to end by talking to you about dung beetles and NEP. Go. Unbelievable. A horse, a domestic horse, is allowed into NEP. They were, you know, they were. This horse craps next to Charlie Burrell, who owns that NEP. They keep talking, all the dung beetles come out, they keep talking, they turn around, and all the dung beetles are dead. All dead. I mean, like 40 dung beetles got their legs up in the air. Do you know why? It's because the domestic horse is being wormed. So it doesn't get worms, and the worm comes out when it craps. So just imagine around every country in the world, every time the sheep are crapping or the cattle are crapping and all the rest of it with wormer, you're killing, the, you're killing the worms. And the worms underneath it in the soil are dying. We've got to understand ecosystems, not just individual acts. Um, but it's exciting because we know that, so we yeah. can now start yeah. getting cross about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tim, thank you. And, and, and I just want to say, Kathy, immense thanks for setting us off. Lucy and Bella, wonderful setting up comments as well. We're only just scratching the surface, and we should have had more of a discussion here. But thank you, Monse. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Delhi, very much for being involved.